exactly that. What you might do is you might say, um, yeah, I just need some more information or something else just to kind of pass the buck, just to tick your box. What you're not doing is you're not thinking about what the customer query is. You're not listening to them, you're not considering their perspective. All that you're doing in that particular example is focusing on yourself and on your target because that's how you get paid at the end of the day. That's your financial incentive. That is naturally what you're going to be focusing on. So why is it that you introduced the 48 hour target in the first place? Well, in theory, it's to get people working harder. But you can clearly see from these sorts of examples, it gives you other behaviours that you can't always predict as well. What typically happens as well is that they don't just respond with an email saying, yes, thank you very much, and don't actually help you. They respond to that within 47 hours and 59 minutes, because that's what they're measured on. There's no incentive for them to do it quicker, but why would they bother? And what that means is that you'll then go back to game. And of course, what happens is the clock resets. So they have another 48 hours to deal with the query. You might respond to them within 30 seconds, but they've then got another 48 hours to get back to you with might be another <coughs> fob off of not particularly answering your question. And if you work as a manager in this particular part of the company and your staff are answering emails within 47 hours and 59 minutes, you might think, fantastic, we treat customers brilliantly. Everyone is answering their emails and team within this time limit. What you don't realise is that from the customer's perspective, it's taking a lot longer. Which is why you need to make sure that when you put these sorts of targets in place, but also it's about the measures as well. You need to make sure that you try and look at things and measure things from the customer's perspective too. From their first query to their last, run each of these little steps along the way. Otherwise you'll get these sorts of behaviours. Another example of which I'm sure many of you might be aware of is bonuses in the sales teams. So if you work for a sales team, the vast majority of sales teams that I've come across will get a bonus for what they sell. What sort of behaviours might that drive? Sell more. Sell more of anything in particular? Doesn't matter, does it, I suppose? You just want to sell more. Because the amount that you sell is the amount of bonus that you get. What you don't do is you don't think about what the customer actually wants. And so there have been a number of scandals, uh, in the UK in particular, I'm sure there have been some in Vienna and other countries, uh, Austria and other countries as well, where what happens is that salespeople follow that bonus. They don't listen to the customer. And if anyone is aware of the um, payment protection insurance or PPI uh, scandal in the UK, the banks in the UK have literally paid out billions of pounds worth of compensation over the last few years to people because they've been missold things. So this is another example of where if you don't actually give the customer what they want, if you're chasing sales targets and you're just selling customers anything they might not be aware of, they might not need, that can cause you extra costs, not necessarily there and then, but perhaps later on down the line as well. And it's only those banks who didn't do that, of which I don't think there are many, if any, actually, who avoided that massive litigation, those massive costs as well. But people have this mentality where they think that people who are in their team wouldn't work unless they've been given incentives. But what should be considered as one of the key system thinking principles is what you want is for people to be motivated not by bonuses or hitting useless SLAs, but by actually doing a good job. And by doing a good job, you need to give them the right perspective that they're serving their customers or they're selling the right things to customers or whatever else they might be doing as well. And that's something which isn't particularly common. And what this comes down to, effectively, is a way of thinking. So, and I'll, I'll give out the, the slides for everyone afterwards so you'll see the, the links, etc. So they have got the writing those down. What this is showing is that you have your own mental model. You have your own way of thinking, your own perspective on, on life, on the way that you work, on everything. From there, you make certain decisions based on that. And I don't know if I have a... There we are. You make those decisions. That translates to effects in the real world. You're then able to gather the information, the feedback from that, which might influence your decision, which then influences the real world, etc., etc. as well. 
what this called is this is called single loop learning because you have the one loop up there. What systems thinking is all about is is more that what you should be doing is once you understand how things are working, change the way that you approach things. This is what we call double loop learning because you've not just got the one loop up here, but you've got this second wider loop as well. And what this might come down to in the 118 example, your single loop thinking would be what they actually did, which was the way that we put things together as a management team with targets and incentives and bonuses is what everyone else does, so it must be right. So what we're going to do is we're going to fire those, those bad people in our team who shouldn't have been giving out the wrong numbers. If they've been using double loop learning, they would have seen that actually what was going wrong is that people were being driven only by the bonuses and nothing else. And so because of that, they were giving out the wrong numbers, and this was all set up by the management team. If they understood that, they should have changed their mental model and say, actually, hang on a minute, in this environment, it's not working. The reason it's not working is because people have given out wrong numbers, because they've been given the incentives, because we put those in place. So let's maybe consider, do we even need those in the way that they are at the moment, or even do we need them at all? And that's how you look at your, your double loop learning. Example for you now. Would you rather catch a train that is on average six and a half minutes late, or on average seven minutes late? Anyone for seven minutes? No. Why would you go for seven minutes? Just to be difficult. Well, it's easy, easier to plan the journey. <laughs> I don't think it is. If it's the same journey time, it's the same train, the same start point, end point, everything else is the same, but one is a little bit later. Naturally, you're going to go for the one which is always going to be a little bit earlier. Makes sense. So this is the train, which is an average 6.5. It's late. You can see along the y-axis here, that's the number of minutes, the red line represents the average. So you can see up and down a little bit. This one represents the one which is an average 7 minutes late. This might change your perspective on things. You might think, um, I'm travelling from Vienna to Prague, it's going to take a bit of time on the train, I've got an important meeting in Prague that I must get to, I can't be late. You might think, with this train, I don't know how late it's going to be, it could be up to nearly half an hour late, even though it's on average a bit quicker. Whereas this train is a lot more predictable, your standard deviation variance is a lot less. So what this train gives you is that predictability side of things as well, which means that you won't be more than 10 minutes late if you take the train and call these numbers, you're much more likely to get to your meeting on time. So actually, in this particular instance, you might decide to take that. You might not. You might just take the law of averages and actually go with that one, if perhaps it's more of a daily commute. What this also tells you, not just about the predictability, is around actually what might be going wrong in this particular system. With this particular one here, you might have had some severe weather events or something like that that meant that the train was severely delayed. Whereas this one, it might be a little bit more mundane, you might not really get a, a, an easier sight for what it is. What this graph will then show you if you present things in this sort of format is actually, why were those trains late? Those particular three that bumped up our average by a large degree, what caused that? Is that something we could do something about? Is it because there was a problem with a particular signal which caused this train to be late by so much? If we fix that, we can significantly bring down um, the average of how long things take. So it gives you those pointers by looking at things in this way. With this one, you might say there might be a couple of things that always cause it to be late. Is there a particular changeover of trains, for example, that might cause everything to be at least five minutes late, or between five and ten minutes late? So it presents things in a different way. And if you're thinking in terms of, from a management perspective, what happens all too often is that you give managers, senior managers, or as a senior manager you receive, reports from your staff on how well your business is doing. You can imagine as a train company senior manager, you want to know on average how long your trains are late by. You might say, yeah, that's a much better train than that one. But in reality, averages can be misleading. It's not just about understanding the variation of those, but it's also understanding actually what are our hot points, our hot spots within that. Can that tell us something that we can learn from? 
And far too often you'll just see that report that says, yeah, 6.5 minutes. Last time it was 6.4, or oh, we're getting a bit worse, we should do something about that. Without actually understanding the detail in terms of what it is. So presenting things in more of this sort of format, you can understand things a lot better. Anyone recognise him? Yes. Super Mario. Super Mario. What did um, Mario do for a job? He's a plumber. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he is a plumber. Yes, exactly. So we are going to go through a, a plumbing example. I'm going to use the whiteboard. So what I'm going to ask you is, imagine you are Mario, but in a slightly more real world context. Imagine that you're Mario and you work for a big utility company. Uh, in the UK we have British Gas, in France there's EDF, I don't know who there is in Austria, but that sort of company, big, big company. And imagine that you're a plumber, you work for that company. Now, in this particular example, um, you're given everything that you need to do your job. Um, in the, the morning of the day, um, you're told um, the details of what it is that you need to do and where you need to go, and you then have to go in and solve customers' plumbing problems. The question that I have for you, and I'm going to start making a list, is what is it that you need to have in order to fix that customer's plumbing problem right first time? So, shout some things at me. What, what would you need as a plumber? Tools. Tools? Tools? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Knowledge. Tools. Anything Knowledge. else? Knowledge. Knowledge. Experience. Yeah, I'll put, I'll do something like experience. <laughs> what else do you need? Okay. I don't know if you can read this pen, maybe not the best. Try this one. <clears throat> Accurate idea problem. What else? Good timekeeping. Uh, I'll put that as enough time between jobs. Can you read that? What else? Spare parts. Oh, sorry. Spare parts. What else does that sorry? Plunger. Plunger. Uh, tools. Tools. Plunger. Anything else? What else do you need? Probably a better outfit. <laughs> a better outfit. I'll put outfit on that one up. You might get uh, something supplied by the utility company. What else? Some assistance if the job is big job. Okay. Assistance. Big job. What else? What? The details of the problem. Uh, accurate idea of problem, yeah, details of problem, ah. yeah, yeah, yes? The okay of the insurance company to fix it. The what, sorry, the? The okay or the approval of the insurance company. Okay, yeah, that's a good one. Okay, I'll keep on going, anything else? Information about the customer. Like where the person lives or something. There we go, yeah, great. The address of where you're going. Uh, I'll put customer name as well. You probably want to know that. Anything else you might need? Well, don't you also need like an actual management or someone to connect to the customers? Or is that like a separate? Yes, so just to be clear as well, sorry, I maybe didn't explain it fully at the start, but if you work in this particular environment, then what customers will do is they'll phone a, a main call centre and they'll speak to the person at the call centre and in that call centre they'll take the details of the problem and that will help with the scheduling of the job for you as a plumber past that point. Yeah, sorry, I didn't say that at the start. A van or load transport. A van? Yeah. Anything else? I think we're probably... Is there more? Okay, I'll leave it at that. Right. That's the first step. So we've made that. Let's hope you can all read that. If not, I'll just read them out. So my next question is, 
Now that we've made this list, this is a list of things that you as, as Mario, as a plumber working in this company, you need all of those things to be able to go to the customer and to fix that problem for them correctly the first time. <laughs> the question that I have now is, if you as the plumber didn't have that, is it the responsibility of you as a plumber? Or is it responsibility of the system in which you work? So let's start with the first one. It might be a little bit clearer, but it's not obvious already. So having the right tools for the job, is that the plumber's responsibility, or is that the responsibility of the system in which the plumber works? The system. It's required to have them. It's the system required to take them as a Yeah, Okay. And there's a little bit of a grey area here, but with this particular one, what I'm really asking for is, Who's most at fault of things going wrong? I mean, yes, the plumber might forget to pick up his tools in the morning, but if he works for a big company, then it's the company who are going to supply the tools. So in this particular one, I'm going to put system. That's okay. Think about majority. And there's a little bit of both in each of them, but we're trying to think about the majority responsibility. What about having the right plumbing knowledge? His responsibility. Is responsibility? Would everyone agree with that? Yeah. It's also the responsibility of the yeah. system to train you. Yeah. I think this is a, a particularly unusual ex example, a funny example with this. Because with knowledge, I think, I would suggest it's a bit of both. Because yes, it's up to him as an individual plumber to, to know and to, to take in that knowledge of how things work. But absolutely right. It's up to the system, it's up to his company to provide him with the right training and the right expertise. If um, his um, plumbing knowledge doesn't get refreshed because technology moves on and there's new modern boilers and he isn't able to keep up with that, that's not really his fault. That's the fault of the company. But I'd probably say there's a bit of both. So I'll go with system and individual for that. Having the right experience, <coughs> system or individual. Absolutely. And if you, as a plumber, or if you're hired as a plumber for a company, and as part of that interview process, they don't test your plumbing experience or what you've seen, then that's the system's fault for hiring you in the first place. But I'd, I'd probably go for a little bit of both on that one. What about an accurate idea of the problem, bearing in mind that in this particular system way of working, which I think is fairly typical, fairly normal, the customer will phone the call centre, it's the call centre person who logs it, and that's then passed on to the plumber. So having an accurate idea of what that problem is, is that the system or the individual? System. System, yeah, because as a plumber, you're told this is what the problem is before you go. Whether it's right or not, you won't know until he gets there. Having enough time between jobs. System. You said both? Mm -hmm. Because if they overbook that person, that is the system's problem. But if the person is lazy in his job or her job, then that's his problem. So it's both. Would you think that, okay, what proportion of plumbers would you say are uh, lazy? Do you think it's a normal thing? Do you think people go to work thinking, well, oh, I'm going to be lazy today? I can't really be bothered. I don't know how it is in the UK, but in my country. <laughs> <laughs> They like to stick around as long as they can. <laughs> <laughs> what I would argue in that instance is that typically, again, I think there's a little bit of gray area, you might get from in that, that sort of mentality, but, but typically having enough time between jobs is part of the system because it's part of the booking. And again, with part of systems thinking, what we're trying to think about here is that it's not um, just about what you as a person do, it's not just about sweating the staff. What you're trying to consider is how we make things better for people. Um, spare parts, I'll probably answer this one myself because I didn't necessarily explain it, but as part of the system in which he works, the plumber will collect the parts in the morning as well, so that would be a system. Um, having the right outfit to wear, it will be given it by the company, won't he? That would be a system. Again, there's a little bit of individual in there, he doesn't put on the right thing in the morning, but as a majority of, of instances, we think of system. Um, Having assistance if it's a big job. System, yeah. You'll need to be given that help by the company. In particular, depends what the, the problem is. Um, approval from the company to fix it. 
It could be the system, isn't it? Having the right address. Clearly it's the system, he's told what that address is. Customer's name, same thing. Having a van, system. So, is there a bit of a theme that you might be seeing? And this is a yes, it's a particular example. And it's, it's a good one I find to talk through because it does give this sort of outcome. But what we're seeing here is that a majority of things that could go wrong, you could blame most instances on the system. There's a little bit of individual in here. There's some things around knowledge, experience. The individual piece comes in a little bit to some of those other ones as well. But as a majority of, of things, the thing to realise here is that if things can go wrong, they tend to be because of the fault of the system rather than the fault of the plumber. Another one that I'd add to this list that we didn't mention is attitude. It kind of comes back, I think, to what we just mentioned a couple of minutes ago there as well. If the plumber has the wrong attitude, which causes the job not to be fixed properly, is that up to the system or the individual? <coughs> what I would say with that one, and I'll, I'll leave it just as, as this, is that if you are a plumber and you work in a system where you're not given the right tools, you don't given given that you're not given an accurate idea of what the problem is, um, you're not given a nicely fitting outfit, um, you're not given enough time between jobs, you're given the wrong address, the wrong customer name on a regular basis, your attitude is going to stink because you're being affected by the system. So even something like that, where you think, well, clearly the attitude is, is an individual thing. Well, actually, if all those things could go wrong, it's not their fault. If they have very little influence over what those problems could be, then naturally the attitude is going to be bad as well. So next time the plumber comes around, or the electrician, or anyone like that, maybe give them a little bit of slack if they're late, or they don't quite have the right tools, or whatever else might cause them not to fix things properly. So what I would highlight with this, I think we've seen it with this particular example, it's the system, not the people. And this is a, a, a key principle of, of systems thinking is that the system that people work in accounts for up to 95% performance. And that's a fairly extreme system, it's up to 95%. Um, when I send that slide you can check out the particular references if you want to have a, a bit more of a look behind the science behind that, but it comes from, from Deming and the work that he did. And so the conclusion from that is that to improve the performance the most, you as a manager want to concentrate on the system. Telling people to work harder will only get you so far. Sweating your staff will only get you so far. What you should be doing as a manager is improving all these different things that we talked about over there, or whatever's applicable for your system in which you work as well. Because if you can do that, you can improve performance the most. Yes, please. Um, what do you do with um, systems that the manager cannot influence? Um, what are you thinking of? For example, a uh, salesperson. For example, a, a Samsung salesperson selling washing machine in a jungle lease. Okay. And he's out. Mm -hmm. So what could uh, the sending manager do to uh, change the bad system at the jungle store? What do you think he could say? If you were in that situation, if you worked in John Lewis and you sold Samsung washing machines and everything was going wrong and you couldn't really sell anything because of some problems in the system, what would you do? You, you, you talk to to the person. So if you're if you just talk about yourself as the manager or yourself as the employee in that situation, I guess it applies a little bit to, to both. If you're the salesperson, then what I suggest is that you might be able to talk to your manager, and explain to them what all these problems are, and get them to try and help you fix things. If you're the manager in that situation, you want to understand what's going wrong. So in the sales example, you might want to understand well why you're not selling things. Is it to do with our location in the shop? Is it to do with um, the price of the goods? Is it to do with whatever else it might be? You'd want to understand the reasons why. Because if you can understand those reasons why, you can make a list similar to that, identify the things that might be going wrong, and then hopefully do something about it. And there is going to be, I see what you're saying, sometimes there's limited influence over what you can have. So with something like sales prices, if you're just a sales manager, you could only be able to give maybe some smaller discount. You can't alter the price of the product specifically. Um, so there will be certain restrictions in which you work with in a practical basis. But what I would suggest is that if you can understand what goes wrong or what you could do therefore about that, 
that's the way to approach things rather than just telling your salesperson, well, can you work a bit harder? Because if they're being with their hands tied behind their back because they can't do the sales they need to for the reason, you need to understand that. If you've got those, um, those restrictions and your back market suggests that your, uh, over up your, your bigger system, your bigger scale system is flawed anyway, if your manager of your store doesn't have the authority to say, you know, we're just not selling enough of, of so yes, yes, absolutely. So if you always imagine you're not given that authority in the first place, you're absolutely right. That's indicative of a wider problem in that bigger system of, well, why are you empowering your managers? Why is you, as a senior manager in that company, telling people to do things in a certain way without understanding why, without understanding how things might be different for different people? Think about some of the examples that we talked about at the start, where you need to understand variation. Different customers will want different things. They don't all want things standardised, they don't all think all things in the same way. Yes, there'll be restrictions in selling goods and things. The focus typically is on service organisation with system thinking. But absolutely, if you're in that manager, if you're in that position as a manager, if you're not given that empowerment, that's a symptom of a wider problem of that lack of empowerment. Okay? Perfect. So um, the other thing that I'm going to talk through in terms of system thinking. Another piece of terminology, there's a little bit of terminology, but I will explain it as we go as well, is talking through two different types of demand. So remember that demand is what customers are asking us as an organisation to do for them. And system thinking categorise things in, into two categories. You've got value demand and you've got failure demand. And what value demand is, it's what we want as a company, it's why we're here, but I would suggest that you concentrate on the definition of failure demand, which is more powerful, which is demand caused by a failure to do something or to do something right first time. So, for example, if you forget um, to, to do something and that causes the customer to phone you up and ask for it to be done, that's an example of failure demand. If you um, fail as a plumber to fix the problem first time, and the, cu the customer has to phone you up and say, well, I need to come round again, the problem's not been fixed. That's an example of failure demand. And what failure demand is very powerful at suggesting is that by its definition, it's preventable. If it's something that you can um, prevent in the first place, then what you can do is you can stop that demand coming in. And I don't know if any of you guys have ever worked in a call centre or a call centre type environment, but what typically happens in that environment is that if it's, if it's outsourced, so you've got another company running it for you, that company will get paid on each call that comes through. There is zero incentive for them to get fewer calls coming in by stopping your failure demand. If anything, they want more failure demand coming in. It means more money for them, more calls coming in. But what you should be looking for as a, as a company, as a service organisation, is think about, actually, we want to stop that failure demand coming in. If we get less of that coming in, it allows us to concentrate more on the value and it reduces cost overall. So, a couple of examples based on what we've just talked through. So, if you're a customer and you phone up your um, large utility company, as we talked about, and you say, I need a plumber, I have a leak. Do you think that that is value demand or do you think that that is failure demand? Yeah. You'd probably say that's value demand. Because as a, as a utility company, you, you'd have your call centre, your plumber set up because you want to fix leaks. So you want customers to phone you up and say that they have a leak. That's kind of why you're there to help them out. Um, what about that one? The plumber didn't arrive when they were supposed to. Is that a value or a failure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a failure. Because if they turned up when they're supposed to, then that wouldn't happen. So we've got a question? No, I won't say it. <laughs> okay, great. So yeah, that, that is an example of a failure demand because if it's done right the first time, you wouldn't get that request then coming into your call centre or whatever in the first place. Um, my plumbing problem has not been fixed properly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Quite obviously, if it was fixed properly the first time, you wouldn't get that request coming in. Uh, the last one, I was out when the plumber came over and need to rebook. Value or failure? Do you sort of say value? Why do you think it's value? Well, because it's a 